Naya Mori, Namaste, and of course, warm Pacific greetings to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for those that are tuning in live on our Zoom platform, as well as those that are watching this on the US Embassy Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining in this afternoon. Uh, as you are all aware, this month has been dedicated to International Youth Month, and the US Embassy Youth Council have come up with various activities that have engaged youth uh, amidst COVID-19. We've had several uh, Talono sessions. We've had the US Embassy Careers Week. Today, of course, we are having the Intergenerational Dialogue and coming tomorrow as well, we'll have our final event, which is the US Embassy Youth Council's virtual concert. Uh, thank you all so much for being part of today's uh, Talono session. Uh, we have a dynamic group of individuals that will be sharing their experiences on today's theme. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome our special moderator, Mr. Lavi Talani Seru, who is uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, just uh, for formalities, uh, we're now going to cross over live to the U.S. Embassy Silver Office, whereby we'll have a few words from uh, the U.S. Embassy representative, Madam Venus. Over to you, Madam Venus. Hello, Bulevinaka, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are here to discuss the topic of embracing traditional Pacific connections to the land and sea. I would like to thank our speakers today, Patricia Malon, uh, solopreneur and social, uh, social scientist, the SPOT, uh, Branish Sharma, foundation, uh, founder of the Smart Farms Fiji Foundation, May Meli, young indigenous feminist, and uh, Mickey w uh, Wally, House of Cla uh, Chameleon. So our, thank you so much for our moderator, uh, Lengi Saru from Alliance for Future Generations. Today's discussion will look at how food systems have evolved over the generations and how they can be made sustainable, uh, sustainably innovative ways of farming and ensuring that there is a minimum harm to the environment. So this is an important topic for us all when it comes to environmental sustainability. It, it's the future of our of our every one of our nations. So I thank you all uh, for being for being here and I look forward to the amazing discussion that is about to partake. You have a good day. Thank you so much, Madam Venus, for your short remarks on behalf of the US Embassy. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the co-focal point for the U.S. Embassy Youth Council, Avikesh Kumar, to also share words on behalf of the U.S. Embassy Youth Council. Avikesh. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you, Venice. Um, Bola Vinaka and one Pacific greetings, everyone. Um, I would like to just formally welcome everyone um, to the second last event for our International Youth Month, the Intergenerational Dialogue. Thank you so much for taking out your time and being with us this wonderful last afternoon. Um, a special thanks to, uh, to everyone joining us on Facebook um, live stream, welcome. And everyone joining us here on Zoom, welcome. Um, a big thank you really goes out to our panelists and to our moderator, Mr. Levitan Alangi Seru. Thank you uh, for coming up, uh, coming and joining us for our session today. Thank you to Mr. Rinesh Sharma, Ms. May Mili, Ms. Mikiwali, and Ms. Patricia Malam. Thank you guys. For joining us today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, today's insightful discussion will focus on recognizing power in intergenerational action for sustainable food system and planetary health, embracing traditional Pacific connection to our land and sea. So this is um, this was the theme for the International Youth Day um, by the UN, uh, by the United Nations, and we are happy to accommodate um, this discussion here today. We as Pacific people hold great essence and interconnectedness with our land and our ocean. Not only is it held at our heart, but our people have long history and preservation with our land and our seas. Um, and it has deeper meaning basically to, to engage into our environment as Pacific Island people. The roots of our culture hold a great part of our identity and what makes us as a Pacific Island people. And therefore we should continue to hold on to and pass our values to make us, or rather the values that make us uh, as strong Pacific Island people that we are. Um, so I'd like to welcome all of you to have a wonderful discussion here today and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Broderick. Thank you so much, Avikesh, for your remarks this afternoon. Uh, as always, our panel discussion is uh, comprised of many 
uh, experienced and well-versed individuals in the field. And I'd also like to take this time to also acknowledge our sign, in, sign language interpreters for being present with us uh, this afternoon. We'd uh, now like to hand over this time to Lavetalani Sir to begin the moderation for the intergenerational dialogue. Over to you, Lani. Thank you so much, Broderick, and, and thank you to the US Embassy Youth Council team. Um, it's a privilege to host this um, panel discussion and to have diverse um, young prominent leaders um, in, in the area of food security, but also in the work around social justice and ecological justice present. Um, my, <coughs> my role is basically to moderate this uh, discussion, which we hope will uh, sort of unearth and then bring to the fore some of the uh, good and best practices and also some of the inspiring transformative works that are being led by young people and showcase you know, what are the young people are doing to address uh, food security or you know, our failing food system and share some of the you know, uh, insights on the challenges and opportunities. So let me begin by introducing our uh, panelists for this afternoon. And I'll begin by introducing Mr. Rinesh Sharma, Rinesh is, a, is the founder of Smart Farms Fiji Foundation. He is a award-winning, vibrant, result-oriented and qualified software engineer with you know, specialization uh, in building automated climate resilient greenhouse. Um, and his work is to, uh, is to allow and also to help grow food in a sustainable way with technology embedded in agriculture. He has you know, a vision of uplifting vulnerable and the poor. Rinesh has started entrepreneurial ventures to educate people on sustainable farming, improving local food security, curbing some of the gender inequality graphs or um, uh, gender inequality um, yeah, that, you know, that's present in uh, our society and also to close the generation gap by involving youth in the agriculture. Uh, Rinesh has been awarded many awards, not only at national, but also regional and global level, and has been a recipient of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, support and also support from, you know, um, the One Young World. Mulevinaka Rinesh, and welcome to the panel. Our next, um, our next panelist is Lady Miki. Uh, Miki Wali is no stranger to you know, the youth development space. She's the co-founder and the di director of House of Chameleon um, and also part of the board, mem board of directors for the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network and is a board alternate chair for International Lesbian, gay, Lesbian and Gay Association, ILGA. Uh, welcome, Miki, to this panel. Our third panelist is a young, enthusiastic indigenous feminist who has worked uh, previously for the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Um, she has worked also for Corey Peter, which is a model, child, mo mobile, uh, model town charitable trust and has been part of various youth groups. She is currently working for Family Pacific as a central convener, and she has also volunteered for the Song Song of Akmarama uh, Itoke. Welcome, May Milly. And our final panelist is Patricia Malam. She is, she is a solopreneur and social scientist. That's the first time I've come across uh, that uh, title of solopreneur. Um, and, and she works, she specializes in traditional ecological knowledge and disaster risk reduction. She has experience in developing greenpreneurs through public private partnerships and an advocate for environmental sustainability through inclusive community participation in economic development. Welcome to the uh, panel, Ms. Malam. Thank you so much. So uh, as you've heard, we have you know, some esteemed young leaders and speakers on uh, this afternoon's panel discussion. And we know that you know, this year is the big year for food. 
the UN Food Systems Food Systems Summit is, you know, is going to be held in New York later in September this year, for the premium summit that had um, taken place in Rome um, in late July. And, and we know that you know, the attention to food system is much needed. Um, we've seen some of the challenges, whether it's around hunger, whether it's around obesity. The Pacific has you know, one of the highest rates of obesity in the region um, across the globe. And also as, as a result of farming and agriculture, we are seeing you know, um, the biodiversity being uh, you know, put at, uh, is, is declining at a much, a much quicker rate. And also um, you know, it's contributing to some of you know, the, the cause of, of climate change. Many people continue to live in poverty. Uh, you know, they're not able to afford healthy, healthy diets. And shocks, whether they are man-made or natural, uh, are becoming more common, especially here in the Pacific region. And we continue to see that agriculture sector as well as the fishery sector continue to be uh, impacted. So uh, I'll begin my questions and I'll try to make this a sort of a Talanoa um, process. And I would like to begin with uh, Rinesh. Rinesh, you are a, you know, um, uh, you know, agri entrepreneur. You you started uh, your your initiative of engaging you know young people in building climate resilient uh, agriculture. You know how uh, how how is this? Can you you know tell us about your work and how is this you know working toward better planetary health? Um, in you know in the in the various spaces that you are that you're part of. Thank you. Uh, uh, my the perception is quite, you know, I try to keep it simple, you know, the backbone of any nation is agriculture and fisheries and the backbone of any individual is good health and nutrition, you know, having traveled, you know, studying abroad, you, you see so much diversity, you see so much issues, and then you, you see, let's just say health issues, you know, because like, let's just say I studied in India, so I saw all ranges of food, you know, food that you can get sick the next day. And you know, and there's so many processing, so many preservatives. The way commercial agriculture has dependent on uh, on heavy chemicals. So I had this perception of like, let's come back to Fiji, and stay in Fiji, and make my scholarship worth it, and you know, do something for for the nation. And the whole goal was just to sustain for my parents. So I started off with this technology I made. Uh, this automated system I made, sort of, it was um, a compromise of software engineering, electrical, electronic, and then. I went soilless because in Fiji, we are bombarded by a lot of cyclones. Uh, that is, you know, farmers have multiple losses that's not accounted for. And so I thought if I take this technology in and then, uh, and, and then the yes, the yes grant was available and, you know, I capitalized on that opportunity and sort of, I started off as a commercial farmer. Yes, uh, and then we were hit by cyclone Sarai and cyclone uh, Yasa, <laughs> then the pandemic, but, but that didn't stop me, you know. I think the more I got to the depths of agriculture, the more I realized that there was the there was a bigger issue. It was where people were not connected with the idea of securing their basic necessities. So me being me, um, trying to challenge myself every day with because in engineering we have a mindset that it can be done in a better way. That's you know it's never like okay it's all done and said. So yeah, I kept developing initiatives, improvising, and then I started teaching what, uh, what, what gave me success. And it's sort of like we develop systems and then we train people. Today, I do see house-based commercial, uh, mini commercial farms that people are having through my trainings. And I think this is just the, the, the foot in, in, in the door with, uh, with, in terms of tech embedded agriculture, in terms of recycling waste, uh, in terms of energy uh, conservation, in terms of water conservation, uh, and in terms of making food transparent, accessible, and affordable. Something, you know, for the Fijians, by the Fijians. Yeah. Thank you, Rinesh, for that. Um, and, and I love that, you know, idea of, you know, uh, Fijians supporting the Fijian economy, but also ensuring, you know, healthy, affordable, uh, diet for for everyone. Um, Patricia, I'll I'll move on next to you. And you know, you are someone who you see yourself as a social uh, scientist. Um, 
specializing in traditional and ecological knowledge and disaster risk reduction. And Rinash, Rinash had tech, uh, touched upon some of the, the key points of how we are sort of impacted by disasters. In, in your view, you know, as specific um, islanders and, and traditionally, you know, what are, what are your view in terms of how connected are people to the land and the sea, you know, in these modern times? Now, you know, Rinesh has talked about, you know, bringing in innovative ideas. Um, but I, from someone who sees herself as a sole entrepreneur, entre sorry, um, as I said, I'm totally new to this term. Would you, you know, explain a bit on, on those connections? Yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, but before I begin, um, I would like, uh, I wish to acknowledge the custodians of this land. I also acknowledge the elders past and present. And I acknowledge and respect the continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and the region. I respect the capacity and resilience to uphold the values of tradition through sacred protocols and willingness to engage in conversations of sustainable development. So yeah, to answer your question, um, is there a connection between um, disasters and food security? Am I correct in understanding the question that you posed to me, um, Sarah? Yes, yes, you are correct. And and if you can touch on, you know, the, the relevance of those uh, in, in, in this modern time. Well, um, based on data, like, you know, the healthcare data that we're seeing, it's sad to say that um, the increasing number of NCDs that are prevalent in our current population are rather high. So I can safely say that um, there is a huge disconnect between healthy eating as well as planetary health and then the ability to um, kind of recover from disasters. Uh, our community, and when I say community, I mean like in the Fiji Islands, the majority of the people have become so reliant on processed food. And in some ways it is, um, I guess, it's become kind of like a safety net because we're being bombarded by so many natural disasters and you know such thing as a pandemic where we need to resort to food that has longer shelf life but the payoff there or the opportunity cost is that um, our health is at stake so you know there's like that balance that we need to achieve between how do we eat healthy when we're in a state of crisis or when there's a disaster looming but um it's not all sad because even though at the current uh, in the current situation, we have this struggle of like trying to be healthy and trying to rely on food systems. If we look back at our previous generations and the traditional food systems and how they worked with food preservation methods and just how they managed to have food security despite the crisis they went through, we have a lot to learn. Thank you, and and I certainly agree with you about you know the point around food preservation, but also food processing, uh, and the how you know those are still very much uh, useful um, in in this you know crisis um, given uh, time that we are in, and uh, I would like to move on uh, to Miki. Um, and Miki, you know, you you work with one of the marginalized groups, or you know, one of the vulnerable groups in community uh, in in society, uh, and this uh, the LGBT the LGBTQI community. Um, and you know, if you can probably share with us some insights of the type of challenges when it comes to food security for these vulnerable groups, and um, and what you know, what are some of the the actions that they are they are taking as as a community to address this. Okay, well, thank you, Lavatanalangi, Sir. It's a pleasure to see you again, um, having coordinated a very successful climate summit, so uh, climate justice summit. So, congratulations to you and the PKN family across the Pacific. I want to take a moment to, first of all, honor and recognize um, 
IYD, which is commemorated on the 12th of August every year, um, which is a time when the world come together to, well, the hope is that the world and its leaders and its people come together to recognize um, the contributions young people have made, not just in terms of population and development, but in terms of um, the ability to exist and be celebrated because of who they are and what they do and contribute to economies across the world, North and South. And so thank you to the coordination and organizers for this, Avikash, Broderick, and all the team at the council. You're doing a great job in all that you do and I understand the pandemic has made us do all this um, Zoom calls. And I have to admit that I am getting to a stage where Zoom fatigue is such a thing right now, but there are ways to cope with it. So um, also just wanted to recognize um, such leadership like yourself, Lavetta Nalangi, in terms of the work you do and also the award that you received. So congratulations to you and um, what you do and all those at AFG and et cetera. So you're doing great work. And so I just wanna take a moment to recognize and acknowledge that as well as the panelists on this panel um, who I'm getting to meet for the first time, two of which I haven't met. Um, so Patricia and uh, Rinesh Ritesh, I stand corrected on the pronunciation of your names. Um, and a pleasure to also uh, see May Millie, uh, a dear friend who I've got to meet in the feminist space. Uh, so in terms of the way we see things in the Pacific, here in Fiji, uh, due to the marginalization of certain communities, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that um, food is a human right, okay? And the, the right um, to live in dignity is important, which means that, um, having not to be in any situation of hunger um, and malnutrition and insecurity in relation to uh, the sustainability of food generally. So it's important that we first understand and unpack that food is a human right. And it's important that we recognize that um, as we talk about food, that you know, no one in this world should be um, should have to suffer from hunger. But the reality is such that um, we do have people that are living in poverty or some below the poverty, way below the poverty line. We've seen reports, we've heard of um, news um, where people are not having enough on their table. Um, and it even becomes a bit more far worse for, for communities who are marginalized, who have to uh, deal with the systematic and structural trauma of inequality which has held them um, to be in situations where they cannot access um, food. Um, and the pandemic is a time, is a great uh, way to also deal with a case by case scenario because this pandemic has also exposed many more kinds of inequalities. And we are seeing that, um, you know, our communities have to one, reach out to get food rations and forms of uh, welfare and social security, which they don't often get. Um, because of the, the current situation of stigma, discrimination, and oppression that is within the system. And so we've got to deal with that first. And then secondly, in a situation of um, uh, natural catastrophes, etc., cetera, um, that happen, um, not many members in the community um, uh, are able to access services in a more free and just way. Um, perspective and that's also equally challenging for them and then we also have to deal with with the fact that um, policy making is far from recognizing the inclusivity of um, certain populations that have been marginalized for too long in terms of access to services um, food and nutrition agriculture etc and I guess some of the key recommendations is going back to the way we are structuring um, the architecture of policy making. Um, are we at the are we designing um, tables where um, there are uh, homogeneous and hetero perspectives, which then only allow for certain kinds of recommendations and solutions that are based on the economics and financial status of a situation in country? Or are we really going to deal with the actual human dignity of communities who, um, as I've mentioned already, have suffered from um, inequalities, etc.? And so there's a lot of things here to unpack in, in particular, because to talk about the food systems, we've also have to realize we've come from like about um, certain layers of different things. So one is colonization, then we have the industrial era and parish of militarization, which all have had a political play on the way we are distributing um, uh, not just 
food in general, but also how we're taking a look within the policy making space. And because the task committee in our work is based on policy and law reform work, particularly for marginalized group for trans and gender non-conforming people, and we work a lot with um, PSGDN and RPF and a couple of others in the region, we have been able to see um, that there is still a lot of suffering in terms of um, just uh, with the inequalities that are existing. So it, there has to be a lot of uh, systematic change in order to address um, what it means for marginalized communities to have equal access um, to food. Uh, and the food system that we talk about has to be one that recognizes, can you hear me? Okay, you're back. Okay. Just go ahead. Yeah, I don't know where I last left off, so I'll stop there for now. That's okay, Lavet and Alani. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, thank you for sharing those, you know, interconnectedness between um, not only food system, but also uh, systems and policy change. Um, and, you know, the, the importance of, you know, human rights based approaches as well. Um, I'll turn to Maimili. You know, Maimili, you, you a indigenous young woman, and, you know, you've worked with feminist organizations. And Miki, one of the things she touched upon was around systems change. And I wanted to ask from, you know, perspective of someone who's young uh, indigenous feminist, what are some of the challenges for young women and girls and also for those of diverse, uh, you know, um, sexual and gender identities in terms of um, advancing this work around transforming and building, you know, stronger food systems? Um, uh, it's uh, good to be, you know, in the in to be part of this. Um, could you please repeat uh, your, your your question? Sure. So you know, uh, as a young indigenous, you know, feminist or woman who you know who's worked with uh, feminist organization who's worked closely with you know women and girls, um, one of the things that Miki had touched upon in her earlier statement was around system change, and from your perspective. Uh, and also from your work experience, what are some of the system uh, barriers to you know, effective women and young women's participation in the work to build, strengthen, and transform our food system at the local uh, level? One of the challenge of being an indigenous young woman is that you know, we have to come in and we have to sit and listen. Eh? Um, I, I think you've noticed that I've also, um, I'm also part of the Songo Songo Vakamarama. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. I'm also part of the uh, Songo Songo Vakamarama, the indigenous women's group. Um, one of the challenges that we've, I've always uh, faced, not, but, but I'm not sure if it's only me, but other young women as well, is the, the intergenerational gap. You know of the of information sharing you know even though you know the, the older women having knowledge of traditional knowledge while we are also trying to get those inter, in, intergenerational knowledge but when you come in and ask the, those questions you know sometimes we're always uh, often seen as you know you're not supposed to ask those questions but for me personally one of the challenges that i feel and i think that we should change this is that we need to start teaching children at a very uh, younger age so that they would be able to understand and appreciate the value of science you know, in everyday life, you know, at a very young age. And we also need to um, allow community members to know about um, traditional practices as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, Maimili. Um, and, and Rinesh, I'm, um, you know, uh, from what Maimili had talked about, uh, you know, she's talking about intergenerational gap, uh, uh, you know, and, and some of the, the other barriers. How is your work, you know, um, with the, the organization that you're leading, how are you addressing some of these gendered impacts um, and, and challenges, um, again, barriers to effective women's participation in, you know, the food security uh, and also food system methods. Yeah, ha having having grown up by a very strong mother and a sister, you know, it was young to realize that women play a very crucial uh, role in a man's life, and I guess the entire world. Um, 
so for me, agriculture is is for everyone. You know, it's um, for the special, for women, for youths, and I know that that was my perspective because I saw agriculture in a way that I empowered myself to break my barriers. You know, and you know, you know, and overcome challenges. I feel like if we solve our food systems, half of our problems are solved. And with my experience, you know, having impacted over more than 5,000 Fijians with our trainings, you know, I would, I would say about 73, 74% of them were women who were interested in agriculture. And I think women do make up most of the agriculture, you know, in the entire globe. So I saw it as a way of, of empowering women to take up these farming methods and, you know, be independent. Um, independent and you know move from a uh, home concept to a commercial commercial setup and also when you when you look at when you look at how this economy is you know one thing we forget uh, in in the rush for money power and status is that if we don't cons i mean if we don't preserve the the um nature there will be no economy to extract resources from and make money you know so i i think I think my whole idea of, of this sustainable and climate resilient farming system uh, uh, approach is that we empower men, women, and especially youths as well, especially youths. Even, even, even I, I'm, I'm, I, we've trained about six informal settlements and I've always believed that if you empower the poor and the marginalized, you eradicate people out of poverty. And it's really important to connect people with your initiatives. Otherwise, it's just a handout. And that's been going on for decades. You know, things start and then they finish before, you know, the projected dates uh, or in the year or two. So I think connecting people to these initiatives and COVID plays a key role in making people realize what your basic necessities are. I know in during these times, domestic violence, molestation, rape is pretty high, not really covered, but I'm, I'm quite aware of it. And, you know, it just it just saddens me. But, you know, but then you can only work on your initiatives, which I'm doing is like whenever I get a chance, an opportunity, I would love to involve uh, the marginalized and the women and especially youths uh, to take up agriculture and create more farmers in Fiji because Everyone talks about food systems. No one talks about building more farmers. You know, I, I, and that's something I always say. Thank you so much, Rinesh, for sharing that. And, you know, the work that you are leading to break, you know, that vicious cycle of poverty um, and, you know, in, in empowering those from uh, vulnerable and often marginalized communities, informal communities. Um, on, on that note, I want to ask, uh, the, the rest of the panelists, then, you know, anyone can unmute and speak to this, namely Lee, Patricia, or Mickey. One of the things that Rinesh had just uh, concluded his uh, response with was building more farmers. But we know here in the Pacific, we are also reliant on, you know, our ocean. So fisheries is also, you know, a key sector for our small island um, developing states. And uh, I wanted to ask this question to, uh, the ladies, uh, do you think our government and also the private sector, the development partners are doing enough to empower young women and girls, um, you know, attract them to agriculture and fisheries? If, if not, uh, what seems to be the challenge or what seems to be the barrier? I know for one, you know, that access to land for many young women and girls is one critical uh, challenge. Um, so, um, yeah, we'd, we'd like to hear your thoughts um, on your experience or from your, you know, your work with communities. What seems to be, you know, uh, do you think that government development partners, the private sector are doing enough to attract young women and girls to becoming, you know, farmers and also, um, you know, fisher folks? Well, if you don't mind, I'll speak from my own personal experience and, um... This being from uh, an experience where I myself um, am setting up a farm. So I've managed to go through the process of acquiring a lease in Namosi. And I'm in the process of setting up um, what I'm calling a superfoods farm because I, I believe that, um, you know, like for 
human health, we need to focus on the food that uh, we've been consuming for generations that have been proven by science to be beneficial for us. So in that whole process, um, I found it uh, rather amusing because uh, not many women would, um, or well, let's say the institutions that I engaged with weren't familiar with um, women coming in and doing these things on their own. Uh, a lot of the questions that I got was like, so um, who's in the partnership with you? Who's the man in charge of the farm? And I'm like, ah, okay, so you don't really have to make this a very gender specific industry. Females can get into farming and I strongly believe that they should. And then upon discussing my experiences with other fellow females, a lot of them did not know the avenues available to them if they wanted to get into farming. So uh, I'm talking about uh, professional women who have, you know, might have studied um, land development, mapping environmental science. There's a huge gap in connecting people to access to farming, agriculture, and those opportunities. But I must say that in the, mo in the recent months, uh, and I guess this is kind of like a ripple effect of COVID and highlighting food insecurity issues, the government has somewhat stepped up uh, in providing access to you know, information and opportunities, not just for women, but just for everyone in general on agriculture. But I strongly believe that there needs to be a little bit more being done to enable more women to enter into the industry of becoming farmers or like agricultural experts. And um, I think this goes back to education. Like if you look at our major universities, not just in Fiji, but in the region, like what do the courses look like when they're offering agricultural science? Um, is this something that's being integrated at, let's say high school level at least? Like um, they're studying agricultural science, but are we setting quotas to encourage more females um, are we encouraging at the university level, maybe scholarships for um, women and even educational uh, incentives, uh, maybe even to get more women into, you know, like whether it's through sci the physical sciences or social sciences to engage in agriculture, farming and uh, land development practices. I think there's a huge gap and there's a lot to be done, but it starts with, um, I'd say, institutional reform, maybe even curriculum redesign. Thank you, uh, Patricia, for sharing you know those those insights about uh, um, institutional uh, reform uh, and the review of curriculums, etc. Uh, we have you know just a comment that's just been posted on Facebook by Benjamin Patel. The need for recognition of women and marginalized groups as part of the input variable in the agriculture sector and the fact that government isn't doing enough uh, to allow this process, Mickey. You know, you've worked in um, this space, um, uh, you know, working with marginalized groups and also Mimili, I understand you've, you've done, um, you know, some work around this. Would you be, would you care to, to comment on that? Hi, hi thanks, Lang. Could you please uh, sorry, Lang, could you please, that? I'm sorry, uh, could you please repeat that uh, question? Connection. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll, <coughs> I'll, I'll pose that question first to Miki. Miki? Um, you mm -hmm. know, Benjamin had just posted uh, a comment and she's okay. saying that, you know, the need for recognition of women and marginalized groups as part of the input um, variable in, uh, in the agriculture sector, uh, you know, remains to be, um, to be, you know, an issue and the fact that government isn't doing enough. And, and you know, uh, Rinesh had touched upon this, that women, uh, majority of the women are primary food producers. Uh, what will, what, what's your comment to, to that statement? Do you, do you agree? Um, I know you've touched upon this. Patricia had talked about some of the, you know, the need to review um, the, the systems as well as the curriculum. Um, can, can you add further to, to those system change? Uh, and what if, if yeah. so, what, do, what does those system change practically practically look like do they mean that you know when these initiatives such as um supporting agriculture that there'll need to be a you know a quota for young women and girls uh or you know young entrepreneurship that you know there needs to be a quota for young women and girls and other marginalized groups um so please yeah so please go ahead thank you well you, you know 
uh, I know May wants to add on as well. So kudos to Paul, Pavel, this panel press, Patricia, and also May. Um, I wanted to start first by saying that I think we've heard uh, so much about um, the response and, and there, are, there has been multiple intersecting concerns um, with regards to, um, as particularly for uh, the, the role of the government of the day, um, private sector and what they're doing, development agency sector and partners and a whole lot of other people, civil society included. But let's also be very honest that democratically in any situation, system and state, um, the, the government of the day has a responsibility to ensure that you know no person um, has to suffer from uh, forms of inequalities, particularly in relation to food and hunger and poverty. And then we also understand the, re the realities on the ground is that you know some, sometimes certain incentives work for certain people and certain incentives, incentives rather don't work for some people. So I agree with Patricia in terms of certain kinds of reform and that's already taking place um, to my experience, what I've seen through the work of civil society in terms of educational reform and transforming the perspective and understanding one of traditional knowledge food sovereignty and the sovereignty of farm and moving away um, from chemical kinds of farming and, and you know coming back to the teachings of Gaia, the earth and how indigenous traditional knowledge has been about and, and applying that into not just the science but also to its uh, policy making and how that response can also have a huge impact on having a nutritious and healthy body. And I don't speak as a perfect person because I'm struggling as well in terms of um, you know trying to be healthy as well. You know, there's so many different kinds of kinds of food that are available. So you have to deal with um, the bodies have to really deal with the adaptation and in so many different ways. So to bring that more to a personal perspective. And then I think um, one of the other key things that I feel like we've got to understand is the dedication and service to earth has um, has been here for many years. And the dedication and service to earth has been around for so long that many of our women um, in all the diversities and all um, re recognizing diverse genders as well have played a huge role. Um, the, the fact that um, the ask is around trying to, you know, dismantle the kinds of exist even within food systems and agriculture is fundamental because we have to ensure that a gender responsive element um, is one that speaks to recognizing that you know, women also can play a role in agriculture and farming and they've been doing it for ages. Um, and, and I think that's important to note. Um, and because they've been doing it for ages along the line, somewhere along the line now history, they've been invisibilized for not being able to, um, uh, to be recognized. And I think for many of us who come from backgrounds um, of you know, indigenous knowledge where we know for a fact that um, our community had women at the helm of every family and, and, and community, we know for a fact that that's, that, that in itself speaks so much words. I also just wanted to say that on the lines of uh, Benji's ask in terms of um, the, 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 the levels of uh, inequalities in terms of um, how a lot of um, state decisions, duty barriers that make have a huge impact and that's actually true. And so I think it's important that um, to leaders as well and, and people in private sector and anyone that has um, access to policy making um, and decision making, um, tables um, and processes is to ensure that we prioritize um, the urgent need of diverse communities who haven't, as, as mentioned earlier, who have been marginalized for too long. So this is about not just uh, changing the system, but also changing the game. And this is really about coming back to understanding uh, what then are the priorities and how they can do it. And I feel like people, try to want to open up the spaces, but they also need to know how to do that so that we have very less harm. And a lot of that harm can actually have a huge impact on people. So it's important that we also apply the do no harm um, principle um, as we move on to recognizing recommendations. And one of the things that I think Bench is also concerned about is really stuff around whether or not we should have special measures or not. Um, we've also, in terms of a human rights perspective, like. We've done the whole 
um, ratifying and signing of international human rights treaties. So having that application in country, in country and domesticating that is fundamental. So that also means that everyone has the equal to, to be part, not just of speaking, but having access to some kind of decision making that um, recognizes um, the needs of uh, diverse communities. We can have special measures that's important too. Uh, for marginalized communities. And I know the work of Rainbow Pride Foundation in particular has been about the Down by the River research, which I know, Lani, you were part of some time back. And so one of the key recommendations as well has to, has to be about opening up the humanitarian response lens a bit more. So that's where uh, we can also start a lot of this conversation and ensuring that that's also linked to agriculture whether or not people are receiving um, the, the support that they need agricultural wise, um, farming tools, um, you know, knowledge about farming, et cetera. So all those little things and adding on to what Patricia has mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, Miki, for bringing in that you know, human rights and inclusion uh, perspective or inclusion lens, uh, and also for calling for more strong uh, gender responsive actions whether it's you know, policy program or practice. I'd like to move on to the next question and I'd like to pose this question to May Mili. May Mili, you brought up one of the challenges earlier in your statement and I just want to revisit this. Uh, you talked about <coughs> the lack of intergenerational spaces. Um, and so throwing that back or bouncing that back to you, what are some of the intergenerational actions that are required for planetary health and sustainable food systems. Okay, so can someone add me merely as a panel? <laughs> so uh, just just revisiting, uh, just to pose that question again. Uh, you know, what are some of the intergenerational actions that are required for planetary health and sustainable okay, food hi, systems? Okay, hi Cyril. Sorry, I'm back. Okay, hi Cyril. Sorry, um, I keep going in back and forth. Um, I think your question is, uh, what are some of the intergenerational actions that we- That is required right? for I, I planetary for me, health and sustainability? Uh, uh, for me personal, personally, I think we need to start uh, teaching our children at a very early age, you know, a better understanding and to appreciate the value of science in everyday life. Uh, and also we need to um, let communities understand that traditional practice and science, you know, they can, merge in you know and i believe for me this is one of the most effective approach you know with the with methods of assessment and and monitoring you know um i'm going to give an example of uh, the intergenerational act actions that you know uh, to sustainable food system is that um, a village in uh, i think in in Teilevu, Udinivanua, after implementations of uh, scientific uh, monitoring of fish and oysters in the coastal area, women were able to collect, you know, twice as many oysters and fish. And this is just because they were able to combine the traditional practice and science. So, you know, in, if Latin communities knows about this information, you know, we would be able to sustain our food systems. Thank you for sharing that practical example, um, maybe Lee. Um, and I, I, if you don't I'm mind, to... uh, can I just add to that? Exactly. If you don't mind. Go ahead. That? Yeah, and I think one of the, I mean, being, uh, as I was told, I was invited on the panel because I'm an older person and I quite like that. So, you know, I just feel like I really must um, kind of share my old person perspective on what needs to change if we are to encourage this uh, intergenerational knowledge sharing and um, two of the things that i've come across in uh, my work as a researcher and social scientist is one of them is documentation and verification so like uh, not just in fiji in the entire pacific region we're seeing a huge um, lack of evidence or like documentation of traditional practices and you know we all know when we watch the meke it tells a story when we hear certain folk songs it also tells a story but then over time um all of that erodes and the versions change you know almost like chinese whispers and there is a need more than ever now for us to begin documenting or if we haven't or uh, we've started already in some uh, situations like you know um, canoe building and weaving off mats there are certain publications that are coming out now and uh, even more recently uh, one of my friends Sala she came out with uh, a publication around indigenous knowledge on fisheries 
So documentation is very important, but even more so is verification. Because our traditional knowledge has not been documented as much as Western education, there may be kind of um, differences in the versions that you would hear. So the verification is important so that the end user is able to know that what they're reading and learning from is you know, actually what it is meant to be. And then uh, the other most important thing in this whole intergenerational um, kind of strengthening uh, food security systems is cultural education. And um, one of the amazing examples I saw was up in Nambukaluka in Naita, Syria a few years ago, where children in a classroom would um, be exposed to Western learning, you know? So they're in a classroom, they're reading from books and all of that. And then there comes a certain time during their day, there's a period where each class is actually sent outside, they go to the river and they learn how to catch prawns, they learn how to do things outside in nature. And usually that component is not uh, led by the teacher, it is led by an elder in the village. And I think that is very important in ensuring that our Pacific peoples are educated in a, um, what can I say, in a wholesome way, you know? So we're getting the Western perspective, that um, documentation, which is science-based, but we're also getting the education from our elders, which is also acknowledged and respected as a form of education. So informal education is just as important as formal education. Thank you. I also wanted to add on it, that's okay, Lani. Go ahead, Miki. So as I concur with Mimi Lee and uh, Patricia, I also just wanted to say that even the concept and, and the term intergenerationalism, when I first heard about it, it um, came to me as also a concept of um, decolonizing power structures, dynamics, and, and situations and realities, because we know for a fact that in decision making, majority of decisions are made by a generation, um, by the baby boomers generation X, et cetera. And so millennials and post-millennials very seldom um, are included in, in certain processes and spaces and situations and realities. And the realities are such that because of the, um, because of the not so much recognition or the de-recognition the, the de of young people, uh, power and dynamics in, in the spaces and the intellectual property that they also bring with them too, we fail to also recognize the agency and autonomy that young people um, also have. So we have to be honest and real and critical about what kind of solutions we're talking about with reference to intergenerationalism. Um, the gaps are there. Um, we've seen um, how um, because of the failure of young people not being able to design policies and, and response efforts in humanitarian crisis in relation to food, things are often different. So having young people's perspective within the whole intergenerational mix is not just something that should be done. It has to be a fundamental primary priority. We need to be at a space and time where we can recognize the contribution of what young people can um, do. And, and until we, we, rec we have to first of all recognize um, the agency and autonomy that, and the resources that young people bring into various different kinds of critical spaces. So whether it's the food and agriculture, um, whether it's also to do with um, many other intersectional injustice and inequality issues. So that's important. What I also wanted to say is in, in terms of the intergenerational leadership that we should be moving towards, I think it's important that, um, first of all, we understand critically what kind of power dynamics that we are in. Um, if you look at the country as a whole, can we recognize intergenerationalism as a concept within development plans um, where young people can design um, and make decisions on this. So there's many things that are involved. And I think it's important that we recognize that holistically to be able to serve um, and, and also uplift many other people who are millennials and post millennials. At the same time, I'm often reminded of um, uh, one of my bumbus who is from Kandavu in Onovambia. And one of her teachings um, has been always about going to her garden and talking to you know, flowers and their growth and, and ensuring that if she plucks out um, a flower in Infurium in particular, which was her favorite flower to plant, that she also seeks apology to um, the, the plant that she's planting, the Infurium in the wild garden. 
And so these are the kind of knowledges that I don't think like many young people um, have access to. So even having to learn from that and just to, to understand the philosophy of it all and the ideology behind it is also very important. So there's so many ways of sustainability and security towards food and farming practices when we come to understand intergenerationalism, because it's something that has been missing for so many years in this country. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mickey, for, for sharing that. Uh, you touched on you know, that holistic approach to intergenerational learning, uh, but also around some of the, the philosophy. <laughs> and as you were talking, it reminded me of this time I was in Savasavu and we were, um, we heard from a woman who is part of the Song Song of Akamarama in, in Savsavu. And she was talking about basically that, you know, um, our approach to, you know, any effort for sustainable food system uh, or food security must be grounded on those philosophy or values, core values that guide us as, you know, uh, uh, as Itauke people, or you know, as indigenous communities, as well as and you know, in different ethnic backgrounds, they have their different sets of value systems. Uh, and one of the things she talked about was, you know, when she used to go out with her grandmother uh, to pick, uh, you know, to bring food, she would often see her grandma talking um, as she, you know, as she's um, speaking to the plants, as she's, you know, uh, uprooting the. Uh, cassava or you know um, harvesting the cabbage and and that was a recognition of the connectedness that people back then um, between them and nature that you know as they are taking that they're also you know giving back um, and you know it's it speaks to what Patricia had talked about earlier about the, the importance of these uh, traditional uh, practices and the need for it to be documented. And it's good to hear that, you know, already there are efforts to document um, agriculture and also uh, fisheries knowledge. Um, so, you know, these are, these are good, um, good, good, you know, good efforts that are, that are being currently, you know, being, being led by, by indigenous communities and also by, um, by farmers and, and fisher folks. I, I wanted to ask the next question that I have here, and, and this is directed to Rinesh. Rinesh, you know, you, you are involved in modern farming techniques. Um, and, and one of the questions that I have here is, what are some of the behavioral and also knowledge change that we need in our communities as we work towards transforming our food systems and also caring for the planet? So what are some of the the, the behavioral uh, and also knowledge change uh, that is required based on your experience. So, so you know, for, to start from myself, to see the change I wanted to, to see, I had to be the change, you know, you had to lead by example. And the way I glorify being a farmer in Fiji on international, regional and international level, it makes me proud, you know, it makes me proud because I've, I've come across many people who said, you know, I want to go back to my land just because I see how you left it for, for them. They see a software engineer leaving everything and coming and becoming a farmer. No, no, it's not. It, I mean, that's that's not the, the link, but but it's, it's good to inspire in that way. And the behavioral change begins with you, I think. And I'm going to rephrase this again, like COVID has been a wake up call for every individual that do you have your basic necessities secured, you know? Because that's a sustainable livelihood, you know? We are so used to, you know, driving to the supermarkets and filling our trolleys. And I think decades ago, we would go hunting with our, with our spear, you know, with, our, with our weapons and all of that, that kept, kept us fit. Uh, so I think, I think it's, it begins with yourself. It begins with the individual because, and then that individual and the family, and then they make up the society, community. It's a ripple effect. It's a ripple effect, and I think one needs to realize that their health is in their hands. And I think for me, from for me, it became from cultivating crops. I, you know, I felt like I was cultivating hope, hope for people to take responsibility and leadership for sustainable livelihood by securing their food. Um, another another aspect is that nothing is spoon fed. You are responsible for yourself. 
I think I think there's a couple of things that people people should do is have a green approach. You know, like in Fiji, they have a single plastic use concept, but you know, you can have the concept of just using fabric bags and and uh, how you if you if you want to reduce carbon footprint, you know, meat production is the most environmentally destructive industry. Uh, so, you know, if you, if, you, if you reduce your meat production and move to healthier foods or being vegetarian, you know, that's totally up to you. I think you, you, um, you have a better health as well. Uh, smaller families, yes, because population is on the increase, about 7.5 billion population uh, till date, maybe 7.9 billion. And, you know, the, the demand for food resources is extremely high. And I think when you have a smaller, smaller family, it's easier to provide. And I, I, think, I think in terms of having approaches of where you plant more trees around your house, it's more like your natural AC. Uh, you know, you take a bicycle if you have to, you know, um, to reduce uh, energy consumption, I mean, fuel, fuel consumption and carbon footprint. You can also plant a tree. You know, I think they should make it imperative that every student who graduates, it's compulsory for you to plant a tree. <laughs> so that adds more greenery to Fiji. And uh, I think throughout its life, a plant should absorb a ton of carbon at least. You know, to have a better approach, you can pay attention to labels. For example, you know, vitamin, not vitamin, let's say orange juice, it says 100% orange, but if you turn it around, you'd see so much sugar content. So I think, I think these are the few approaches one can take uh, in order to uh, transform food systems. But all in all, it's, I, I, I prefer people taking the responsibility of growing food right at home rather than depending on the supermarkets and commercial agriculture and fisheries. Because I'll be very honest, whether it's the way food is grown today, the reality is whether the, the way food is grown today, the way it is packed and processed and preserved is leading us to the pharmaceutical industry. So it's sort of a poison cartel. We, you know, we, we, we are headed in that direction and that is the reality. If you get imported crops from New Zealand, but they look good, but they were harvested like four, four months ago, you know, and you're eating something which just looks good, but actually it's, it's, it's not. It has pretty much the lowest nutritional value. So I think, yeah, go local, eat local and, you know, uh, have, have more greens than meat in your diet some of the approaches. Thank you, Rinesh, and you just delivered some, you know, really powerful statement uh, uh, in that, you know, uh, you mentioned health, you know, is in your hands and then cultivating hope, uh, but also need for more greener approach. Um, and, you know, you touched on how, you know, our current status quo of producing food is leading us to pharmaceutical uh, industries. And I've seen Miki has just commented to the, to the poison cartel. And yeah. uh, I know that Patricia would like to add, um, if I'm correct, uh, you wanted to add a point uh, in this discussion as well. So I'm going to hand over to Patricia. Yes, yes, sure. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, while Rinesh is doing amazing things and uh, revolutionizing just how we have access to food, um, the other thing that we're seeing more and more of um, is that, you know, the demand drivers for the food or types of food has evolved, you know, whereas... Um, before it was okay to kind of um, export just, you know, any kind of fish. I mean, it would be A grade, but then now there's a demand from the market to be like, where did this fish come from? How was it caught? What practices were used? What was done to it in the supply chain? And then this gives rise to uh, something that's relatively new in the Pacific, but it um, we have some local organizations or some local young people who are championing uh, blockchain technology, like, you know, the traceability of food from farm to fork or from, you know, like uh, the ocean to from bait to plate, as they say. So I think uh, one of the innovative um, mechanisms we have available to us is the use of technology. And that's another way that we can connect um, people in rural communities who may not have access to international markets, but, you know, giving them the education to make them understand that, like, if you grow uh, food a certain way using certain uh, practices or the absence of chemicals, or if you fish or capture, um, you know, things from the ocean in a certain way, you might get a higher value for your product when it gets to the market. And then 
allowing them or kind of working with them to capture the data, feed it into a system, and then, you know, apply um, traceability all along the supply chain so that by the time it gets to market, we know where it's come from, we know the practices that were used. And then, you know, like there is um, a cycle of benefit for people all along the supply chain if we implement and use technology to our advantage might also avoid food fraud. Langi, I also wanted to add, if that's okay, I think it's important um, that we also find ways to uh, sustainably keep traditional seeds, um, the seeds of the food that have been around for some time. I mean, um, we obviously want to hear more products. And so it's important that um, how we um, look after the seeds of uh, plants that have been around that haven't been, you know, revolutionized by chemicals and toxic and poison. Um, and so I think it's important to come back to understanding that to protect food freedom, we must also protect um, the seed freedom and, and that the seeds of um, the, the kinds of food that we have that hasn't been touched by any kinds of chemical is also the source of life. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your responses to those, uh, Rinesh, Patricia, and, and Miki. Uh, Rinesh, sorry, I'm going to come back to you with this final question that I have here that I've been tasked to ask. So, it, and it's on the role of modern uh, farming techniques uh, in transforming food system uh, for human and also for planetary health. And I know Patricia had touched upon a bit of this and some of the, the work that's, um, that's being done uh, um, to not only trace, uh, you know, from farm to fork, but also, uh, you know, create more co conversation or, um, or opportunity to, dis to discuss with communities about how, you know, they can uh, produce more healthier foods and, you know, that can create, you know, uh, uh, more value for what they, they're producing. Yeah? And, and so, um, Going forward, as you know, we are moving, you know, beyond the, the to the 21st century. Uh, what what is the role of these, uh, you know, modern food uh, farming techniques or yeah, modern farming techniques, innovation, uh, ideas, and you know, we know that many young people have this drive, uh, the ideas, the energy. Um, so. Um, what are, what are some of your thoughts around that? What are some of the, the opportunities for young people as we move uh, you know, into this digital era um, and the way that we can not only promote healthier food options, but also how do we ensure that production, consumption and distribution uh, in a way you know, doesn't uh, harm the environment, doesn't harm, you know, rights of people who you know own lands indigenous people uh etc etc so um yeah if you can give your um your brief comments on those okay um yeah very long question <laughs> i should note it down um you see the the idea of innovation is it's, it's quite easy to talk about it innovation resilience sustainability uh, from 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 experience on ground level, you know, you know you have you have com composed something in the office, but when you get to the ground and actually you're deploying it, I know it's 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 not as easy, you know, it's not as easy. Uh, so uh, innovation in terms of uh, using modern or you know uh, equipment is it's very necessary. The world is changing drastically, you know. This we will come past this pandemic. But climate change is my biggest battle. And with climate change, you know, the, the, the extreme temperatures and cold nights and basically plants and even livestock, fisheries, they survive in certain parameters like human beings. So now with the major industries and countries around the world who are heavily polluting the environment, all in all to make profits, you know, and then we in the Pacific, we contribute very less to it, but we suffer the full brunt of it, you know. So I think I think it's 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 imperative to implement modern farming solutions in Fiji. And now, like, so if you have soil, do soil farming. And soil farming requires uh, rotovators, tractors, uh, making raised beds. There's there's a tons of implements. 
that should be readily available and that too quite cost effective too um, for the farmers. And then a backup training again is, is necessary because you would want that equipment to last with you because like I, I farm, I'm on the farm for like 10 or 12 hours sometimes, but it's my passion that keeps me going. And sometimes it's at two o'clock, I look up at the sun and I just, uh, even I get tired. I, I get tired, I'm, I'm burning down. But my, my point is that when you introduce machineries uh, for basic cultivation, you take off the pressure from human effort and it's, it's, it's a sort of, you can redirect or create employment in other ways of packaging, distribution, you know, and all that sort of things. So, because you have to keep that balance of introducing technology, but at the same time, you're trying to employ people. It's not that, you know, because that happens with automation. When automation comes in, you don't really need people, okay? So, um, so one of the methods of farming is soil farming. The other one is that if you don't have space, you don't have good soil, hey, you could opt for hydroponics, okay? Which is, which is another method of growing plants in a, in a water-based um, as a medium. And if you have the expertise, uh, you could also implement aquaphonics, which is basically the um, uh, man-made ecosystem of the fish with, with the plants. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a man-made ecosystem where both coexist and you harvest the fish and you harvest a variety of plants. Uh, and I think, I really think that is, that is the future of farming. Now, the current problem with our farmers is that there is a huge generation gap. Uh, my biggest advantage is that I am an engineer and I like to develop these technologies by myself. You know, it's not just bought off China or, or some overseas country. You know, I'm really connected to my system. But my, my point is that our farmers are above 40, 50, they're in their 60s. And they, on, on, a, on a realistic note, they would, they don't even want to touch a smart device. They, they wouldn't, you know, you know, it's like, I got a question asked last week uh, at a virtual seminar that if there's a weather app that could be used by these farmers, but when you sit with experienced farmers, you know, they would probably see some certain pest or insect and they would be like, oh, it's going to rain. You know, that, 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 that knowledge, you know, you don't learn it in school, you, you learn it from experience. <laughs> so I think, I think um, technology is not widely embraced and accepted as of yet, but hey, it's, you can only try, you can only try. And I, I really have high hopes with the youths of this nation because anything used in, in, the, in the right way, the internet is the best thing that has happened in the 21st century the way technology has revolutionized many industries. I think it's about time that people uh, or, um, uh, you know, uh, many people or even, even government NGOs, you know, they even introduce experts in terms of uh, introducing technology in fisheries and agriculture. Uh, and I think, I think it would only then, you know, create that, that certainty that, okay, this is how we are doing it in Fiji. This is the technologies being used. And um, yeah, when you, when you involve technology, you practice precision agriculture. Basically you have a higher chance of uh, yield outcome and outputs, and either you have a good return on investment uh, or you know, you just, you're, you're just uh, sustaining your life if it's done at a home level. So, uh, but currently, um, that's not the uptake with with technology because my first take was on M-Pesa. It's hard for people to people don't people just want to pay cash, you know. So, you know, you have really have to do your research, and and we really have to uh, uh, devise. I guess I guess that's still in the process of devising people devising a solution where people embrace technologies in in the in the rural communities. A network is another issue. So the uptake is slow, but gradually. It will happen, you know, you just got to stay positive. Thank you so much, uh, Rinesh. So now uh, I'm going to uh, open up the floor for Q and A's, question and answers. And I've seen questions are already coming through the chat, but also from uh, the, the US Embassy Facebook page. And uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll ask these two questions first to um, Mamie Lee. Sorry, uh, to Patricia and then Mickey, and then we'll come back to May Millie and 
uh, Rinesh. So uh, to Patricia, you, you, one of the questions that has come is, you know, you've talked about traditional knowledge. Uh, the question is, what needs to happen so that, you know, we can share traditional knowledge around food preservation to young people? That was the, that was the question for Patricia. Thank you, Lovett and Alahi. I think um, first and foremost, there needs to be some form of uh, documentation or, well, actually, can I take a step back there in terms of uh, before we get to documentation, it's just the acknowledgement and the value of traditional ecological um, practices. Because, uh, you know, just like naysayers across a range of issues, you know, like in politics and vaccinations and tax and all of those things, we also have naysayers when it comes to traditional, the value of traditional knowledge. So I think first and foremost, if we are to rely on knowledge from our elders and previous generations, we need to first acknowledge it and then um, move on to the documentation verification process so that it's accessible. And um, this is uh, leaning on something that May Mili had said earlier, you know, like there is a lack of women engaging in farming practices or in agriculture because they haven't been given a seat at the table. And this is probably because there is a lack of knowledge sharing, but we need to create repositories for this information. It's very valuable information. We need to make it accessible for everyone. Um, and you know, lucky for us here in Fiji is that we don't have policies that inhibit women from getting an education. So <clears throat> in the absence of immediate uh, access to traditional knowledge, I would suggest that we encourage more, um, more mothers and more elders in the home to be more proactive with sharing traditional knowledge, some of the practices. And uh, um, we all know that uh, women are the first educators, you know, from the time you're born, who's the first person that teaches you anything? It's usually your mom or your grandmother or aunt, that, that maternal figure in your life who is your first educator. If we encourage more of that home-based education to begin and then strengthen it with education in um, schools, that is the combination of both Western and traditional knowledge, I think there is a lot of hope in terms of us um, integrating science and traditional knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And, and linking to that, and if I can ask this question to May Mili, uh, how, do you, how do we strengthen intergenerational dialogues as a leadership tool in civic and community spaces? So that's a question from uh, Abdul that's been posted on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, how do we strengthen intergenerational dialogues as a leadership tool in civic and community spaces? Uh, really? th thank you, Langi. Yes, thank you, Langi, for the... Sorry, my network is a little bit down. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, how do we strengthen... Um... Intergenerational dialogues. Sorry intergenerational dialogue. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put out um, a personal um, experience for me as a young woman. I never really, you know, at this age, I, I never really wanted to um, learn more about uh, traditional knowledge until I got to a point where I, I realized for me, I needed to, to make the first step in trying to learn about, you know, uh, the, the knowledge and the traditional traditions from our older uh, generation. So I think, and I believe the, the interest should come from, from young people because like even nowadays, a lot of young people, they really don't wanna know about um, their, their, their history and, and about their tradition. It, it, and I think it's because of, uh, you, know, you know, what's happening nowadays, you know, the, the media, you know, it, it portrays a lot of, uh, of, it, it takes away all those issues, but in, in order for us to, to strengthen that relationship, we need to, to get young people to be interested in the first place and get you know, the older people to be able to, to share that, that, that knowledge. Even though our older generation have those knowledge, they will never give those knowledge without you asking for it first. Thank you, uh, Maybe Lee. 
for, for responding to that question. Um, I have a question here for Miki. Uh, Miki, tra uh, traditionally, what needs to happen as we work towards equality and inclusiveness for LGBTQI members within our communities? And I think this is in the context of, I believe this is in the context of, you know, strengthening our, our food system. So what needs to happen? Uh, as we work towards equality and inclusion. Lani, I'm having a bit of connectivity problems. Could you please repeat that in a bit slower? That's okay, thank you. Sure, I'll do that. Um, so a question for you is, traditionally, what needs to happen as we work towards equality and inclusion for LGBTQI community members within our communities? And this is in the context of, you know, building, strengthening and transforming our food systems. But thank you. So I just wanted to go back to where I left off at one of the points earlier, Angie, but on something I had talked about um, in terms of decolonization, I think, you know, we were once divided by colonialism and we have been divided by gender, race, religion, and class, etc. cetera. Um, but we are also part of the earth and food is the currency of life. And so the food system that is at war with the earth is also at war with our bodies right now as we're currently experiencing, you know, in the South. Um, and I just wanted to say that across the world, especially in the times of the, the pandemic, there's growing consciousness that the multiple energies we're living through have their roots in an um, unjust, non-sustainable, industrial, globalized food system. And therefore solutions to all the, all the crises, all the cries lie in, in also creating local, biodiverse, poison-free, chemical, um, chemical-free food systems that also increase um, nourishment for all beings um, while reducing our ecolog ecological footprint. And having said that, one of the things that I wanted to point out was is that as many processes and spaces are currently opening up now, it is therefore the, the, not just the duty of duty bearers, but also of those that are in these spaces to ensure that um, we don't just stop at equality, that we unpack equality and interrogate it further and ensure that this is also linked to um, communities that are marginalized that also represent their priorities and their needs um, during these times as well. And that in the future, in any kind of um, pandemic or humanitarian crisis, that we don't have to come back always to a situation um, within what we are already experiencing um, and also to recognize that I think there's a lot of work done on discrim um, discrimination in particular. And so it's to show that um, a lot of the work that civil society has been doing is now moving around the area, particularly of reform. So that reform is taking place. And I think we have been told to be patient a lot about all these changes and transformative solutions. Um, and we are moving into that direction where um, we will definitely um, see some kind of um, response efforts, not just from a state perspective, but also um, where communities can continue to demand more uh, for what um, that is rightfully needed and what needs to be prioritized. Thank you, Miki, for your response to that question. Um, the next question is for Rinesh. Rinesh, you know, we were talking about affordability of local produce. Why do you think local produce in many cases are expensive compared to you know, food that are being imported? And how can we reduce the prices of these you know, local foods? Sorry, I'm unable to hear you. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's, there's two angles to this. Uh, one is when you import something in bulk, okay, the price per item is greatly or heavily reduced and, you know, and okay, so that's one, that's why imported stuff is cheap. And, and then secondly, the most important one is that here, like if, you, if a farmer grows an acre of crops and then, you know, he has a lot of, like, like a typical farmer so doing soil farming, you know, he's, and uh, he has his projected for an acre of crops. Now, now it's 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 hundred percent. I mean, it's not hundred percent. It's definite that he will not have hundred percent yield. 
There will be a lot of pests. They can be theft. Something can go wrong with the soil acidity and, and pH, for example. Something goes wrong in the distribution. It's 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 a it's a it's a process. So in the in the process from a seed, you know, first of all, your seeds need to be of quality. You plant an acre of seeds, but you're just gonna have about eighty percent growth. In the process to harvesting, you reach about fifty percent of yield only. This is just harvested. You take it to the market. Maybe you know some took it, some didn't take it, some came home. Maybe from hundred percent, you just sold forty percent because that's the loss you have bared. And if it's around the, the cyclone season, which is sort of really unpredictable nowadays, uh, looking at last year's series of cyclones, you know, a farmer can have a 100% loss. So 40%, the farmer has basically invested everything into it, got 40% sales. Now his input and his return on investment is pretty much the same. So basically what I'm saying is he's he would try and, increase the price just so that he could take out his expenses and his effort. Because as a farmer, if I'm in the in the field, I don't pay myself for the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I don't know, as, as, as a typical farmer, and I know most farmers, they wouldn't pay themselves a wage. No, they don't, they don't do that. So I guess when they have a small supply, they try and increase the price just to get, just to get uh, some returns. But then the problem here is that our farmers uh, are very good on the field. Oh, trust me, you know, I've been inspired by our local farmers because I've been dealing with them since 2014. So they are damn good with growing various crops. But then when it comes to selling them, that's where the problem is. So I'm always about promoting uh, agriculture with the technical skills that's required. But then that initiative with a viable business model that the farmer is able to grow, harvest, and sell. You know, we have over, we have over 200 supermarkets. Uh, we had over 400 hotels in Fiji. You know, you just got to find one supply and be consistent with it. So that is that gap where farmers do end up most of the times selling it to the wholesalers because they find it convenient, although they lose, they lose a huge amount, but then you know, it, it, it's sold to the wholesalers, then it's sold to, let's just say, a supermarket, then it's sold to the public. So that is our current food system, you know, or well, most of it. You know, if you look at even a local market as well. So this is where our food prices are spiked. Uh, and in terms of being seasonal, you know, uh, if it's not in season, it's, it's, a, this, it's a price is skyrocket. So that, that is the current reality. Thank you, Rinesh, for those insights uh, you know, from a young farmer. We fail to realize most of what you've just shared. Uh, for, uh, you know, most of us, we are end users. We go to the market and we complain about the prices of vegetables and crops. You know, it's so high and we fail to realize some of the things that you've shared. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, we are, you know, we just um, right on time. And so I'm just going to ask this final question before I invite all our panel speakers to deliver you know, uh, their, your final remarks. So the question that I have here, and I think it's best suited for me, Nili, um, or any of the other panelists, is how do we ensure or put into practice the engagement of women and youth in decision-making process, especially in the traditional governance system? Uh, thank Mimili, you, Lani, for you that question. That? Okay. Uh, all right, that is a, yeah, that question for women and youth in, in, in the traditional system. Uh, for me personally, <laughs> uh, you know, as a young woman, even though I, I, I'm in my professional capacity, when I go back to my community, I will always know my place. You know, if regardless of the fact that I, that I advocate on a lot of things in my professional capacity, when I go to the village, I know, you know, in regards to um, decision making in the community, and even as a young person, you know, you know your place. So, you know, one of the things that you can do is, you know, talk to the right person. Who can you advocate to so that your decision making, um, so your so what you're trying to put through could be heard, but then not um in decision makings in the in the 
in tr traditionally we have our own place spaces where we can be heard like you cannot go to a village setting for you as a woman or a young woman and be heard because you have your spaces in your matangali so the matangali meeting that's where you as a woman can be heard because everybody has the same right whether you're a man a woman or a young person it is within that meeting you can always have your say and then decisions can be made and that it would be taking to the bigger decision making platforms so if you want to have your voices to be heard you know i know a lot of people say that women um are not always heard at community level, but it's just you need to understand the spaces that you need to come into. Thank you. Um, sorry, and can I just continue? And also, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and also, we at uh, the um, and uh, and also in regards to the decision making level, it really depends on how our, you know how people at management position how, how they value women and young people and young people because if they don't value young women and women you know they really wouldn't take us seriously because i know i know and i understand i've worked for the ministry of youth and sports um you know but, but these are my own personal thoughts we've never have to value um okay i will take this back as i'm sorry about that but uh women uh, young women you know, they have never really been, um, what, what's the right word for it? You know, it's not like, mm, they, they really don't have that much of uh, programs and other things that like how other, like men, young people are within the spaces. So, you know, even though they say it's for young people, but young women and the, and other, marginalized uh, communities, they're not really um, recognized within the spaces. Thank you, Mimi Lee, for sharing those, uh, those, those perspectives about, you know, what are some of the entry points for young women and, you know, uh, also youth uh, in terms of traditional government system and, and where they can, you know, uh, channel and, and feed their inputs into. Um, and so with that, I'd like to uh, thank our incredible panel of speakers this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Thank you, Rimesh. Thank you, Mamie Lee. And thank you, Miki, for joining uh, you know, this, this panel and for contributing some of your not only real lived experiences, but also some of the experiences from your work, uh, from, um, you know, your businesses. And uh, I'm seeing the comments coming from our Facebook chat, uh, you know, and most of, you know, them are in support of what you've already shared uh, earlier. Um, and it's been, you know, they've shared that it's been a very enriching and learning. Um, webinar for them. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, give this um, opportunity to our panel of speakers, if they can uh, share for one minute uh, or less, it's up to you. If you can share, you know, uh, one of your closing statements before I hand over back to our US Embassy Youth Council. So um, in no particular order, please, uh, you know, just unmute and, and then go ahead and um, provide your, your final statement or key messages that you'd like to leave our audience with this afternoon. Thank you. Patricia, would you like to take the lead and then maybe Rinesh and then maybe Lillian Miki? I don't know, I just felt a bit nervous when you were like, I was in my mind, a thought just crossed and I was like, he's probably going to go age before beauty. So, okay, age goes <laughs> before beauty. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, in closing, I just wanted to reiterate that, like, you know, while we're having this amazing conversation with young people about um, uh, food security, food insecurity and uh, planetary health, what we must remember, you know, above all else is that planetary health is so important for human health. 
So, you know, if you live on a healthy planet, you're going to get healthy food sources, you're going to have a healthy population. And then, you know, that leads people to doing um, good business and things like that. But it all begins with us maintaining some sort of balance on this planet that we call home. And uh, one of the ideologies that I, you know, that I really like, um, when it comes to the theories that describe the ways that we're evolving is the Gaian theory. So, you know, there's a um, the thought that the earth is self-regulating and um, it has a system of, you know, like keeping everything in balance. And this is where disasters and human interactions with the planet come into play. So um, I'd like to invite all of you to, you know, do your bit in... Um, becoming a little bit more aware about the type of food that you eat, the food sources, where it comes from, and just the type of impact it has on a planet as a whole, you know? So like just understanding the carbon footprint of what's on your plate and making responsible choices to consume what's good for you and the planet. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Patricia, for, for sharing that. Uh, Rinesh? Uh, yeah, I would like to leave uh, with a few um, few words um, from from my experience. Uh, I think I think uh, from an early age we need to uh, implement these these ideas of um, tradition, entrepreneurship, and you know, uh, and in terms of uh, you know a, a better life, you know, a better Fiji in the next 10, 20, in the in the years to come from from the primary from the primary school level. Uh, I've had experience of teaching the high school levels on farming, so I know what it's like to deal with the youths of today. It wasn't anything like before. So the seed of knowledge planted at a younger age is, is crucial, um, and this will eventually develop uh, individual mindsets on accepting the truth, doing what's right for everyone and, and the planet itself. I believe that uh, the youths of this country should enjoy their... Um, the challenges they face in their lives, because for me, these challenges were my best learning curves. You know, perception is key. It's, a, it's the ability to find the light in the most darkest place, and that is the best inner strength you can develop. Life is a journey of self-discovery. Uh, education, I mean, your schooling stops, but self-education should never stop. You should keep educating yourself. There's always a new turf to conquer. There's always something to learn. And find your passion in life if that passion, passion becomes your profession and consider it a blessing because you would wake up to something you love to do every day. And you know that would be a very, very blissful life. And thank you for this opportunity. That would be my last words that I'll leave with you. Thank you, Rinesh. And then all the best with your uh, entrepreneurial um, work um, in, you know, and, and you know, empowering most of our uh, our young leaders. Also, I, I forgot to have um, congratulated uh, Patricia. All the best in your um, <laughs> new, um, you know, farm in 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 Amosi, If I, I heard that correct, um, and you know, we'd like to you know see more young women farmers uh, moving into that direction as well. So uh, finally, let's hear from Mimi Lee and uh, Mickey. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, I, I just I would like to just emphasize on you know for for any young people for youth, uh, you know, regardless of what uh, race we are, it would be really good to understand about our traditional knowledge and be able to understand you know once we understand about our traditional knowledge, you know we would be able to know what and what not to do. You know take time to sit with your elders, to, you know, to learn about your past and your history. You know, once we understand that, we would only be able to realize that we are custodians of this planet in, in our land, and we are only here to take care of it and, you know, pass it on to, to the next generation. And in, you know, in regards to our food, you know, we have a clear choice now, you know, we can move to a system that promotes diversity, nutritious food and healthy people. Thank you. 
we're not going to leave uh, maybe leave for that uh, that message and for reaffirming traditional knowledge uh, and also traditional uh, systems um, in 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 this effort to uh, build and also to strengthen our our food system. Nikki. Yeah, thank you very much to you, Lavetta Malangi, for moderating such a great session and to the Youth Council for coordinating this um, on the series of IYD. So appreciating the efforts of Avi Cash, Broderick, and everyone else. I also wanted to thank the panelists alike for your great um, insights and having to listen and learn from you also. That's been well noted. One of the things that I wanted to share as a final remarks is um, stuff around uh, superiority and power dynamics and coming back to that. Um, you know, there's, there's a saying, we're not all superior beings or species in this planet. We're all um, interconnected um, in this planet. So that's important for us to understand. And that, yes, we are cultivating our land and we are caring for the ocean, et cetera, in so many different ways. But we also have to cultivate a lot of opportunities and hope. That's the greatest thing we have right now to be able to transform a lot of the um, systematic and structural inequalities and challenges that um, um, push us away um, in so many different directions. So we have to come back to that. We have to come back to recognizing the planetary boundaries that we have. And we have to really also uphold food sovereignty and what that means for us individually as families, as communities, um, as people um, of Gaia of planet Earth. And I just wanted to also lastly, as you know, during such critical times of the pandemic and also what's happening in Afghanistan, I also just wanna take a moment to stand in solidarity, um, in peace and in also a moment of um, sacred unification with those in Afghanistan um, and also serve as people. So uh, to our audience, thank you so much for joining in this afternoon. We've heard from our incredible lineup of speakers. We've had an excellent, excellent and informative session, uh, but also a very empowering one. They've made, um, they've not only highlighted some of the, the challenges to building, strengthening and transforming our food system, but they've also um, you know, made some call to action. They've shared some of the, uh, the strategies, the way forward, um, and made some of the, the key asks. So with that, uh, thank you to all our panelists. Again, Vinaka uh, Wakalevu, Rinesh, Patricia, Maimili, and Miki. It's been um, an honor to, to host this uh, webinar with all of you. And uh, uh, keep on the, the good work and the good fight. And with that, I thank you once again and thank all the audience and I hand over to the US um, Embassy Youth Council uh, team uh, to Avikesh to, to take lead on from here. Thank you, Naka. Thank you so much, Langi. Thank you to the panelists, Rinesh, um, Patricia, Miki, and me for coming on our session today. It was really informative and I'm pretty sure that a lot of our listeners have taken a lot of insightful knowledge from today's discussion. Um, and that sort of brings us to the end of today's discussion, but just a little reminder to go ahead and buy yourself your wine, your juice and your snack, because tomorrow the Embassy Youth Council will be hosting a virtual concert, a virtual youth concert that will be bringing in local uh, music for us to jam at. And then uh, you guys can come in and do, uh, enjoy with your friends and your family on tomorrow's session. Um, but also I would like to thank everyone for joining us. And just a little reminder that all the discussion that has happened here is the views of the panelists and not necessarily the views of the US Embassy. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone and have a blessed and enjoyable evening.